about 6.30, so <clears throat> probably go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to try and... Tonight's kind of a smaller class, which is good, because uh, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, and so by all means, feel free to ask any questions that you'd like. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and I'll try and probably finish um, around like 7.30, 7.40, so that we can talk for 10 or 15 minutes and get out of here a few minutes before 8 when the library closes. Um, I want to thank you all for coming here tonight. I hope that this class ends up being interesting or helpful for you. My name's Chris Swinson. Uh, I own Mycophile's Garden, which is a mushroom farm based in Grand Rapids. Uh, Mycophile means mushroom lover. Uh, we'll probably use, I'll use the term myco relating to a few different things tonight. Uh, but <clears throat> we started growing mushrooms, I started growing mushrooms as a hobby years ago and just thought it was really interesting. I knew there were all kinds of different edible mushrooms that occurred in the wild. And um, the more I learned about people growing edible mushrooms, the more I realized that anyone could do it. It's, there was just some technical aspects that kind of kept the average person from growing them uh, until more recent decades. And it's also a fairly new sort of de development. People didn't really know how to grow a lot of edible mushrooms aside from shiitake and portobello and a few others up until the last 50 or 60 years and modern mushroom cultivation kind of developed in Asia and moved over here in like the 70s. So anyway, um, it was just fascinating to me and I met a guy at the uh, Eastern Market in Detroit probably around 2012 who had these kits for growing mushrooms now, I was aware that people made these sorts of bags that mushrooms grew out of um, and had kind of grown a few in different ways outdoors, but he had a whole bunch of different types that he grew. And I bought a, a bag similar to this from him, and he told me that if I took it home and cut some holes in it and kept it in a humid place and mixed it with water, that mushrooms would grow out of it. And I did, and it was really fascinating. It was... Um, they grew super fast, and they, a lot of mushrooms can like double in size every 24 hours, sometimes even quicker than that. So watching them grow from day to day, and even from morning to evening, was like this fascinating process. They were oyster mushrooms. I don't have a good example of similar ones here tonight. Um, I usually, we grow a bunch of different mushrooms, but on Saturdays, we sell most of them at the farmer's market. I haven't harvested a whole lot yet this week, but I brought a few types of mushrooms along with me. Um, a couple of oyster mushrooms and a large wild hen of the woods, which we also grow. And then lion's mane is that sort of white fuzzy one. But oyster mushrooms have a lot of like these curves and the gills on the underside of the cap are really beautiful and defined. And they were just fascinating for me to watch them grow. And I ate them and they were okay. They weren't my favorite thing ever, but I love the process of growing them. Uh, and sort of fast forward, because we don't have a lot of time here tonight, but a few years later, a friend of mine um, wanted to sort of develop it into a business, and he helped fund a lot of it, and we started growing mushrooms in his basement for a couple of years, and then in a warehouse for a few years, and when that time at the warehouse was ending, uh, we weren't really financially viable yet, um, and probably weren't going to be for a while. Uh, and the area where we were growing them, the um, warehouse wasn't ideal for a bunch of different reasons. And I thought I would lose the business. And a couple, like three months before our lease ended, a couple of my friends were like, hey, we bought this house. It's out by Ionia, but we've got this really um, steep east facing hill in the backyard and there's four partially subterranean commercial greenhouses built into the hillside and so the hill's so steep and it has big tall oaks at the top that it only gets sunlight till like mid-afternoon in the summer and in the winter it's you know, even less than that and um, the you know being partially subterranean the they have concrete walls and concrete floors so they're not like a traditional greenhouse it's just the roofs are translucent plastic uh, that rigid plastic. And so we put shade cloths over ours most of the year to let in some natural light, but so filter it so it doesn't dry out the mushroom so much. And by being subterranean, it stays 15, 20 degrees, either warmer or cooler than the ambient outdoor temperature, depending on the time of year. And so in Michigan, you wouldn't be able to grow mushrooms in a traditional greenhouse or hoop house. 
outside of the spring and the fall. It's just too cold or too hot. Uh, but there, it allows us to use a lot less um, like air conditioning hello, and, uh, and heat than it would in a traditional hoop house and makes it possible. You can also grow mushrooms like indoors, but um, there's a whole bunch of complicated stuff that comes along with that, which we may talk about later. So growing them in a hoop house or a greenhouse has been really great for us. And we produce around five to 700 pounds of mushrooms a week out of that space. Mushrooms are the most space efficient crop you can grow. Uh, our greenhouse is 20 by 40 feet. It's about the size of this room, but rectangular. Um, so it's um, being able to harvest almost 100 pounds of mushrooms every single day out of a space that size is really neat. Other sort of, we grow them on shelves out of these bags and other vertical crops that are grown on shelves are very low density, you know, microgreens and lettuces. Uh, and so that's part of the reason I've been able to build a successful business business uh, farming as basically like a one-man operation for a number of years. Um, there's not a lot of things you can successfully farm anymore at that small of a scale and actually make some money doing it. So now it's my full-time job and my partner's full-time job and we've got two full-time employees and then a bunch of people that just work for us at farmers markets helping to sell our mushrooms. We mostly sell them to farmer's markets. That's how we started. That's what I like doing. It's satisfying to get to talk to people that actually use them. We also sell a lot to uh, grocery stores and like food delivery services. There's um, Dorganics and West Michigan Farm Link. Uh, Market Wagon are three different sort of online food service plate or like um, d grocery delivery services that we work with. And then Kingma's Market, Martha's Vineyard, Bridge Street Market, and a handful of other stores uh, that we sell to as well. And uh, some restaurants also. Um, so we grow a whole bunch of different types of mushrooms. Uh, I've probably grown, I don't know, 25 different varieties. And within that, probably 10 or 12 different species. Just like there's a bunch of different varieties of apples and they're all the same species. Same is true for mushrooms. A lot of mushroom species have sub varieties that are different and distinct, but um, technically the same species. So some of the big ones that we grow a lot though are pictured here. We've got chestnut mushrooms in the top left, black poplar, <clears throat> lion's mane are the white fuzzy ones. This is our Michigan oyster mushroom and those are shiitake in the bottom right. Uh, oyster mushrooms and shiitake probably represent 50% or so of what we sell. And then all of the other 15 different species that we grow um, kind of make up the rest. Uh, part of that is because people know them, but part of it is because they are really easy to use and tasty in a lot of different things. And so tonight I'm gonna skip through quite a few of these slides because I create the slideshow for a like two and a half hour version of this class that I teach. And we're gonna try to get it below an hour and a half tonight. So um, some of the stuff we won't get to talk about Excuse me a second. But if anyone would like access to the slideshow later, just come up and take a business card when we're done. I've got some up here. I've also got some stickers with a logo on it that everyone's welcome to have one or two of. Uh, take a card, send me an email, tell me you'd like access to the slideshow, and I'll send you a link to it. That way you don't have to remember to write down everything tonight. So we're gonna start with resources though, because uh, mushroom growing is a really expansive topic. Same thing with wild mushroom identification. There's just hundreds of different approaches and different types of mushrooms you can grow. Um, and so a lot of tonight will be an overview and I really just wanna supply you with resources to go out and learn more on your own and sort of a real basic understanding of the process. These two books are probably the two most well-known, most thorough um, books on mushroom cultivation. They were written in the 70s and 80s um, by the same author. And this is the second one. Uh, and it's a little, a little more helpful than the older version. Um, they're both kind of focused on growing mushrooms commercially though. So I really love them. They're still almost everyone's sort of kind of go-to text on mushroom cultivation but they're dry and they're thorough and they're hundreds of pages long and they're kind of tedious to read sometimes. I like the author and I like his writing style, but they're, uh, you know, they're not a fun read per se. And so they can feel overwhelming. And they're also focused on growing mushrooms in a commercial fashion where you're producing larger, 
amount consistently year round. Uh, and that's not what most of you guys are probably here for tonight. So great books, but maybe not the first ones you should read if you want to learn more about mushroom cultivation after tonight. And so the first one I'd recommend is Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation by Trad Cotter. I've got all three of those books up here if anyone you know wants to leaf through them in the few minutes we have after the class uh, or take a picture of them. This one, though, is much more focused on growing mushrooms at home. Um, even on the cover here, he's got mushrooms growing from piles of leaves, mushrooms growing from um, potted like plant pots stuffed with straw. Uh, the top right photo are uh, wine cap mushrooms growing from a bed of wood chips outdoors. Uh, and so his book is really focused on growing mushrooms in more accessible ways. Uh, growing mushrooms commercially is kind of a modern process that involves like sterilization and um, all these different, so you have to have sort of a, a rudimentary clean room uh, and all this kind of technology that goes along with it. But growing mushrooms outdoors, you can sort of get, um, purchase the supplies that you need from someone else who has done some of that sort of sterile work and preparatory, more scientific stuff, and then be able to use them in ways that are more accessible to the average person, like mixing them with piles of leaves to grow uh, mushrooms out uh, outdoors, or certain mushrooms you can mix with beds of wood chips. You incorporate leaves or straw or cardboard into them, depending on what type of mushroom that you're growing. There's a lot of mushrooms you can grow from wooden logs. Uh, it's not as simple as it sounds because you have to have the, like um, harvest the wood at the right time of year and it has to be the right type of tree for the certain species of mushroom that you're growing. Um, but a lot of them are kind of overlapping and some mushrooms will grow on a different variety of trees. And so there's a ton of different approaches and his book is much more focused on that. Uh, it's the latter part of it, this is true for the Paul Samets books as well, near the back half of them they have some sections that just tell you about different groups of mushrooms, um, the different genus or genre of mushrooms, because generally mushrooms in the same genus or genre, same genetic group, kind of grow in a similar fashion. And so he tells you about different genres, uh, the species that grow within them, what they like to grow on, what type of year you would want to grow them in, um, whether they grow from leaves or trees or beds of compost, uh, how to go about putting those together. And then he has a difficulty rating from one to five. And he mentions both indoor and outdoor difficulty. And so some mushrooms, they grow really well outdoors and they thrive in open environments where there's a lot of dirt and bacteria and other fungi growing around them. Um, they, in fact, sometimes need that to live. Some other mushrooms, especially ones that grow inside of living trees or freshly fallen trees, they like a nice, clean, kind of dry environment with no competition, and they don't, they haven't evolved a, an immune system to help them survive in the open air. And so that's sort of what dictates whether a mushroom needs to grow indoors or outdoors. Uh, at least that's part of what you would factor into the, that. And so some mushrooms grow much easier outdoors and others grow much easier indoors, uh, which is a really good thing to know when you're interested in trying to cultivate any of them. And so that kind of information in his book makes it a lot more um, friendly to the average person. I highly recommend it. It's also just a really interesting book. Mycoremediation is using mushrooms um, or fungi to clean up contaminated soil and waterways. Mushrooms and fungi exude all sorts of antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals, and they can be used to clean those things out of environments. But they also, uh, mushrooms exude all sorts of digestive enzymes that can break down a wide variety of different compounds. Mushrooms exist to recycle everything in nature. Bacteria plays a small role as well, but mushrooms basically consume everything and turn it into soil. Basically everything in this room, including us, will eventually be consumed by different species of fungi. And so they have the ability to break things down on the molecular level and turn them into carbons and sugars and nitrogen, and then reorganize them into fungal proteins. And some of the things they can break down are like um, hydrocarbons from um, gasoline and diesel fuel, uh, synthetic dyes, which are notoriously, one, bad for the environment, bad for us, and three, really difficult to break down or get rid of in any way. And so different mushrooms have different abilities to break down different 
um, compounds, including really nasty synthetic compounds sometimes. <clears throat> and so that's what mycoremediation is. Uh, some mushrooms also, they have the ability to absorb and sequester certain things. So mushrooms can't break down um, heavy metals or radiation because those are already, they're elemental, they're not a molecule, they can't take them apart. But what they do is absorb them whole. Uh, and that means that we can use mushrooms to uh, concentrate, uh, remove and sequester contaminants from um, different contaminated uh, environments. Uh, and some of this stuff I'm talking about is theoretical, but a lot of it is really true. And people have been doing really incredible scientific work using mushrooms to um, break down dangerous things, to actually make dyes, because mushrooms also, a lot of them make um, natural dyes, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. They make medicines and all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of companies that sell um, like both materials and equipment that you could use for mushroom cultivation. I mostly have this in here for the longer classes uh, and kind of talk about um, you know, what each of these companies does. Uh, and so fungi include yeast, molds, and mushrooms. And almost basically all of them start out as mycelium. And so mycelium is both this sort of webby, wispy stuff that grows through the soil or through the tree or through the compost or through the dirt. And then after it's absorbed enough energy or the seasons have changed and it's a good time for mushrooms to grow, mushrooms um, grow off of this extensive network of mushroom roots that are growing through the soil or the tree, which we don't normally see. Uh, and so that mycelium makes up that root-like structure within the, the substrate, the medium the mushroom is consuming and growing on, but it also makes up the mushroom itself. So mushrooms are also made up of mycelium, um, but that's the two life stages of a mushroom. There's the sort of vegetative stage where the mycelium is consuming, and then the fruiting stage or the flowering stage, because mushrooms are the sexually reproductive organ of a much larger organism. And that organism is growing in the soil. It's the mycelium that we're usually you know, unaware of. Uh, and so anytime we take that mycelium and we move it from one sort of um, one place to another, like if I were to buy a Petri dish with this nutrified gelatin in the bottom of it, it's called agar, uh, and I had mycelium growing on top of it, and then in a very clean, sterile setting, I would use a sterile scalpel and cut this sort of disc of gelatin into small pieces and drop a few of those pieces into this bag of grain and seal it. And if I did everything perfectly sterilely and no bacteria or mold got in, um, like a week or two later, all the grain would be white and fuzzy. And what I've done is inoculated the grain from the Petri dish. So anytime we move um, mushroom mycelium from one substrate or one medium into another, we're inoculating that thing. Kind of like um, we usually hear inoculation in reference to vaccines. And that's because older vaccines, you were taking a live virus and putting it into a new host. Similar idea. We're taking a living fungal tissue and putting it into a new host that it's going to consume and grow from. Uh, and so I may use some of these terms again here tonight. Uh, people don't always realize this, but mushrooms start from spores, um, all of them. And so do some ancient plants, like different types of ferns and stuff. But fungi, molds, mushrooms, yeast, they all start from spores. And the spores um, are released from a mushroom. They generally are released from either gills or pores or teeth. But gills are what we're most familiar with these little sort of filaments or rays on the bottom side of the cap. Uh, and so they're released, they go off into the air. If two spores from the same species land near one another in a hospitable area, they start to grow this thin, wispy mycelium towards one another. And they actually exude like uh, mushroom pheromones. They exude these chemicals into the soil or the wood around them to help the, them find the other mycelium. Once they um, detect these chemical messengers, they rapidly grow towards one another, they mate. And then the mycelium has all of its genetic material and it becomes much more dense, denser and ropey and starts to grow out in this web-like fashion through whatever it's growing on or consuming. Mycelium by itself is like single threads of um, individual fungal cells or mushroom cells. So it's, it's basically microscopic. It's um, these extremely fine hairs. But when they grow by the millions and millions and millions, they can look like this thick, white, fuzzy, some people would say mold, um, that's growing on something. And it is similar to a mold. Um, the real difference between a mold and a mushroom is that 
With a mold, after the mycelium has grown through the medium, all it does is grow little teeny tiny, sometimes microscopic, um, they look like little trees with a bundle of spores on top. And to us, it just looks like dusty mold, but they're really microscopic tiny mushrooms, a forest of them. Uh, and regular mushrooms just grow a larger version of that. And instead of just having a bundle of spores on the top, it has a cap that produces um, hundreds of millions, billions, sometimes trillions of spores from one single mushroom. Uh, and so they exist to spread spores. And the spores mate, they start consuming. Uh, once they've either reached the limits of what they can find to eat, or different environmental factors have kind of cued the mushroom that it's time to, to reproduce, they start to grow mushrooms from the mycelium. Uh, the mushrooms grow, the cap opens and allows air currents to move in and carry away the spores and it begins the process anew somewhere else. And so, a lot of people contact us because they want to they want to get spores from us for growing mushrooms and mushroom growers don't really use spores and that's because a single mushroom um, this is a an exceptionally um, uh, I don't know, good example of sporulation here. The giant puffball can sometimes release seven trillion spores from a single mushroom, but even small mushrooms release millions of them, often billions. And so uh, each one of them has slight genetic differences between them. And so it's like taking, you know, um, just like uh, you can't really determine exactly what someone's kids are going to look like based exactly on what their parents look like because there's genetic variability between them. Same thing with mushrooms. Two mushrooms can look really similar. They can mate with one another, but their offspring might, you know, it might not fruit well or it might only grow a few mushrooms or the mushrooms might be deformed or not taste good. There's all sorts of different things that could be different about the offspring from when you're using spores. And so we kind of bypass spores. We don't use them at all. And we clone mushroom tissue, uh, which is a whole process um, of cloning the mycelium. And then we grow it out in these Petri dishes uh, that have this sort of nutrified gelatin in the bottom of them. This gelatin is called agar. It comes from seaweed. It's not really gelatin, it's actually vegan. Um, and so, but it has very similar properties in that if you heat it up, uh, when it cools, it solidifies and it forms this sort of squishy mat. And then we add some nutrients to it and you can grow almost any kind of, uh, fungi or bacteria on a Petri dish. And so when you see scientists and doctors like culturing bacteria and stuff in Petri dishes, that's generally what's in it is this gelatin derived from agar. Uh, and so we um, take either a fresh mushroom that, we've, that we want to clone or um, genetics that we've gotten from another source and we introduce them to this sort of gelatinous agar and then it allows us to sort of store the mycelium to move it around in different places without having to expose it to things. It's an easy discrete way to work with it and we call that a mushroom culture. Uh, and so there's a few images here. I want to explain them all, but you can see the different formations it can take. The one on the bottom left is kind of neat. That's uh, where it's consuming a wooden log and it's consuming the softer, um, less dense summer wood before it consumes the more dense winter wood rings just because it's easier to get into and eat. But it's neat that you can actually see it in the photo here. That's why each ring is only partially digested. Uh, and then the one in the top center is where someone has taken um, food dyes and they poured agar in three different stages and they added some food dye to it at each stage. And so there was layers of like green, yellow, and red food dye. Um, food dye is the ones that, you, you know, in the little teardrop, teardrop shaped bottles from the grocery store and that are in you know, a lot of our foods, they're synthetic, they're not natural. And they're derived from um, petrochemicals like gasoline and oil. They're pretty far removed from it, but they're still not necessarily great for us. Uh, and there's a bunch of them that have been banned here, and even more of them have been banned in the um, EU because of their potential um, bad health benefits. But they're also really complex compounds. Most dyes are. Uh, and they don't break down easily, but Oyster mushroom mycelium, which is what's in that petri dish there, can consume them, degrade them at the molecular level, turn them into fungals, sh fungal sugars and proteins and mycelium, and eventually turn them into mushrooms. And so it's one example of mycelium actively breaking things down, consuming them. Uh, that's, this is the mycelium of the honey mushroom, which is a parasitic fungus that kills trees. It's also the largest organism in the world. 
The mycelium of the honey mushroom can grow under the ground, consuming trees and spreading over multiple square miles. There's one in Oregon that covers multiple square miles, and there's one in Crystal Falls uh, up in the UP, just close to the Wisconsin border that covers hundreds of acres. The one in Oregon, this is a big window, but they think it's between 2,000 and 7,000 years old. If it is 7,000 years old, it's not only the largest organism in the world, but also one of the oldest. Um, they discovered some trees in Norway that are 10,000 years old, like last year. Um, but anyway, it is pretty neat and interesting that something that's so like literally um, microscopic on the singular level, these little threads of mycelium, can grow and thrive and spread and consume for 2,000, 3,000, 7,000 years and spread over vast areas. And then every fall, they produce these pretty little mushrooms, which are edible, uh, but also a sign that the trees around them are in the process of dying. So uh, mycelium has all kinds of different properties depending on the mushroom. Um, it's really pretty neat and interesting. I've already talked about a lot of this. We don't need to talk about it all, but a couple of things I'll mention. Um, mushrooms, they take in food from outside themselves. It's called being heterophagous. Plants are autophagous. They make their own food within themselves. And so mushrooms are more similar to animals than plants, um, both in how they eat, but also in how they respirate. Mushrooms take in oxygen and exude CO2. Um, they also produce things like B vitamins and D vitamins that usually aren't found in plant sources, but are found in other animal sources. Uh, and they share way more DNA with animals than they do plants. In fact, supposedly we and all animals share um, a common ancestor with fungi. We evolve from the same thing. And they basically are animals that um, have a non-centralized body because they're, it's, they're sort of digesting outside themselves and spreading out, exuding um, digestive chemicals, whereas our whole body is based around our stomachs and we evolve to be a thing that carries around the stuff that it eats. Mushrooms are an animal that doesn't carry around the stuff that it eats and it just spreads into the environment, exuding digestive enzymes and consuming what's around it, which is part of why they're able to produce such a wide, crazy variety of different compounds. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different ways that they can grow. Um, some mushrooms, a lot of people ask us, well, you know, why don't you grow morels or can you grow morels? Why don't you grow truffles? And the reason that we don't is because a lot of mushrooms, they all sort of break down things around them, but some of them need a relationship with other living stuff to do that. And so the biggest example are mycorrhizal fungi. Myco means mushrooms. Rhizal refers to a rhizome, a small root on a plant. And we don't know exactly how many mushrooms are mycorrhizal. Um, you might remember people talking about like symbiotic or mutualistic relationships in science class. This is an example of that. Um, it's not symbiotic. There's not a lot of things that are. The, the term they use for it now a lot of times is mutualistic. It's this mutually beneficial relationship where the plants either require in order to survive or greatly benefit from a relationship with one or more species of fungi growing in and around their root system. And we don't know exactly how many fungi um, require a plant host. It's pretty difficult to determine, but we do know that over 95% of plants that grow on land worldwide either greatly benefit from or require in order to, to survive a relationship with one or multiple species of fungi. Sometimes it's dozens of species. Sometimes these fungi exist as single cells within the cell of the plant, like they're part of it. Um, other times they exist within the root system, uh, in between the cells. And then most often they exist as a sort of sheath of mycelium on the outside of the root system. And that mycelium is breaking down the soil and feeding micronutrients into the plant because mushrooms, sorry, plants don't digest things. They just kind of absorb water and use oxygen or CO2 and sunlight to make their own food. But with the assistance of mycorrhizal fungi, they're able to um, absorb a lot of nutrition directly, well, not directly from the soil, but from the soil through the fungi. Um, the fungi also uh, it increase the absorption capacity of the plant's root system by a thousand percent because they cover it in all of these microscopic, tiny little um, hairs that absorb nu uh, nu 
nutrition and water for them. And they coat the root system of the tree or plant in this like barrier that is exuding antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals. So they protect trees from drought, disease. Um, they provide them with sugars and micronutrients. And a lot of trees and plants, 95% uh, of them, wouldn't exist or would exist at much much reduced numbers than they do if it were not for fungi. Not only do they make the soil, they are the soil. Healthy soil is up to 30% mycelium by weight. They literally are what plants are growing from and on. <clears throat> and so a lot of those mushrooms cannot be grown without that host tree or plant, which means uh, most often there, when it comes to edible mushrooms at least, the host is a, often a mature tree. And so you can't grow mushrooms like black trumpets or chanterelles or hen of the woods or hedgehog mushrooms or um, morels or matsutake or truffles without growing a host tree along with them, often for decades before the mushrooms would fruit from them. And when it comes to certain ones, especially truffles, the most expensive mushroom in the world, thousands of dollars a pound, um, people have spent, many people have spent millions and millions of dollars and multiple decades of their lives trying to grow them with little to no success. Uh, no one has ever done it in a way that was really commercially viable. <clears throat> there are some other lesser, mm, lesser sought after and lesser expensive truffles, like white truffles, which people have had some success growing, but the most expensive ones um, have eluded everyone's attempts to do it, at least in a commercially viable fashion. Same is true for Tricholoma matsutake, which is one of the other most expensive mushrooms in the world. Um, they just have to grow from these host trees, and we haven't figured out exactly all the ins and outs and intricacies of that relationship in a way that we can recreate it consistently. Uh, when it comes to morels, there have been some progress made. This picture was actually taken in Michigan. There's a company called Gourmet Mushroom up in Scottville. They started in the California in the 70s. They opened a second branch here about 10 years ago, which has been great for me because I buy and resell some of their mushrooms. I'm a distributor for them, uh, for mushrooms that I don't grow. But they were working with a team of scientists at MSU who had been working with um, Chinese patents on morale cultivation. They figured out how to do it, but they just couldn't do it in a way that was commercially viable. And they, they offered me some for a while, and then the next time I asked them about it, they were like, yeah, you know, it was such a process. If we lost a crop, we were just upside down in our investment and basically gave up on it. You can't tell in, the, in here in this photo, but there's small grasses growing in here. And morels are almost always found around the base of mature trees, but sometimes they're found in open fields with no trees nearby. And some Chinese scientists figured out what sorts of plants, smaller plants and grasses, you can grow them mycorrhizally with. Uh, and so the second image here, um, these are pictures. Well, the one on the right is from Scottville, Michigan. The one on the left are some prettier and healthier looking morels being cultivated in China outdoors using really similar um, fashion. Uh, and one of the people that works for me actually is a retired MSU scientist who helps to like, um, he's on a board that gets to uh, sort of rele relegate funding to scientific, uh, agriculturally scientific um, programs. And so they, ended up approving this program about morel cultivation, and then he got to try and grow about 13 different types of morels in his garden with the help of this team of scientists and researchers from MSU. We got a few to grow. There were some things that um, didn't work out as well as we hoped, but it's something that's happening, and I hope that you know, in the future I'll be able to um, do that as well. So there's a whole bunch of mushrooms you can't grow because they're mycorrhizal, um, or at least none of us are gonna grow them anytime soon. And then there's a whole bunch of mushrooms that you might not want to grow because they kill the trees that they live on. And so often these um, mushrooms that do this uh, really like oak trees, but also like maples and beeches, um, most large mature hardwoods are susceptible to some type, sometimes multiple types of mushrooms. And so, you know, if you have a whole bunch of mature oaks that you really love, I probably wouldn't suggest growing hen of the woods or especially chicken of the woods. 
Hen of the woods grows on the base of trees, and sometimes they can live for many years with it, but there's some evidence that it may harm them. Um, chicken of the woods is definitely a strong parasite to mature, usually oaks, but sometimes beeches and maples and stuff. Uh, and so it grows from usually around the trunk, and it causes what's called white butt rot, where the butt of the tree, the base of the tree, rots out, it falls over and dies. And sometimes the mushroom will grow off of it for years, even decades after it's killed the tree. Uh, so it's not something I would grow if I had a bunch of large mature oaks that I care about. Um, I don't. We've got some trees in our property, but they're not oak. So I am going to try to grow some because you can grow them from wooden logs that are partially buried in the soil uh, as well. And then uh, some parasites, though, have to grow from a living tree. Chicken of the woods is a little less, mm, I don't know, picky about that as though. Uh, the honey mushroom's already talked about, the world's largest organism, but another example of a mushroom I would never suggest anyone intentionally grow unless they don't care about the trees that are on their property. Uh, we don't have time to talk about entomopathogenic fungi, but they are interesting. So, um, saprotrophic and saprophagous fungi, these are fungi that consume dead stuff, and these are what we're going to talk about for the next half hour or so, um, because these are the mushrooms that are almost exclusively cultivated worldwide because it's an extremely simple relationship. A mushroom that's growing on a dead tree can basically grow from sawdust, it can grow from wood chips, it can grow from wooden logs. Um, it doesn't need a bunch of other stuff involved and it doesn't need to be growing from a living host in any way. Saprotrophic and saprophages both mean to consume dead stuff. Uh, and that's what most mushrooms and fungi do. And so there's a few different types of them. Primary decomposers are the mushrooms that would first grow on a uh, freshly fallen or freshly killed tree or sometimes on a still living but struggling tree. And so they're not really parasitic, um, but they can sometimes start to grow on trees that are still standing and partially alive. Uh, and we call them primary decomposers because they're the first ones. And so they um, like to grow in fairly um, dense, clean, dry, protected environments. The inside of a wooden log is basically sterile. There's no other molds, there's no other fungi, there's no spores or bacteria. And so that's where they like to grow. And they're also the mushrooms that we as people consume the most because they, um, well, they're a large group of ones that we consume a lot because they grow on trees um, and they're the first things to grow on them. They have a lot of nutrition to grow from and so they get pretty big. They're also uh, what we call secondary and tertiary or third level decomposers. Um, and they tend to be a little bit smaller, especially the third level ones because they consume stuff that's been broken down a lot. They don't have a lot of energy. Primary decomposers though, they're big, they're meaty, they're hardy, they grow on trees, which often makes them easy to identify and safer to identify. Almost all toxic mushrooms in North America grow from the ground. Um, there's very, very few toxic mushrooms that grow directly from a tree. Uh, and so those are just the ones people have learned to consume a lot of times, but they're also the ones that we grow because it's, again, a really easy relationship to recreate. You don't have to grow a whole tree to grow a lion's mane or an oyster mushroom or a chestnut mushroom. Uh, and so field and forest, I mentioned them earlier. I just threw this in here because it's such a good resource. I wanted to include it. If you're interested in learning about growing mushrooms outdoors on wooden logs, um, but also beds of wood chips, they've got great info on as well. But specifically this chart tells you which types of trees, um, which mushrooms will grow on. Uh, and they even have like preferred hosts, ones that they do okay on and ones that they would not recommend. And so uh, growing mushrooms outdoors on wooden logs, they have great info like this. They also have great info on growing mushrooms and beds of wood chips. Um, and uh, let's see, some of this stuff hmm, I have to talk about tonight necessarily. It's the more, um, the sort of rundown of the commercial way that we grow mushrooms. We'll get back to primary decomposers in a second here. Um, but I kind of already explained this really quickly earlier. Um, I'll go through it really quickly too, I guess, because it's a good idea to have an understanding of the whole process before we talk specifically about growing mushrooms outdoors. Uh, and so if, to grow mushrooms commercially, we start by sterilizing an uh, agar medium in a, in a pressure cooker. And then we uh, pour it out while it's liquefied into sterile Petri dishes. Um, we let that cool and solidify. And then we either add spores or some mushroom tissue or mycelium to the Petri dish. Wait a week or two for the mycelium to cover the surface of the agar. 
and then cut it into small pieces in a sterile room using a sterile scalpel and put some of those pieces into a jar of grain, which has also been sterilized in a pressure cooker. All of this, um, regardless of what mushroom you're growing, has to be done in a sterile setting. What I mean by that is uh, sort of like a clean room. Um, so we have professional clean rooms have like the whole ceiling blows filtered air straight down and it goes through the floor. Um, most people that grow mushrooms have a sort of smaller version of that. It's called a laminar flow hood, where it's basically this big box that has a HEPA filter, a high efficiency particulate air filter in the front of it. And that filter can filter out all mold spores, bacteria, um, anything else that's floating in the air down to an extremely small size. The only things that really get through it are viruses, and those aren't really of a concern with us when it comes to mushroom growing. And so there's this filter, and it has this special fan that's attached to it that forces air through it at a very specific rate so that the air that comes out of the front of the filter has not only had all contaminants filtered out of it, it's perfectly sterile air, but it also comes out in a really smooth flow. It's called laminar flow. It's non-turbulent. Um, so for example, if I were to put a candle in front of a box fan, it would flutter all over the place and probably blow out. But when I put a candle in front of my laminar flow hood, the flame shoots straight back towards me and it kind of dances a little, but it's not flying all over the place. And that means that the air in front of that filter is totally clean, it's sterile. And as long as you don't get too close to the edges, um, where you know dirty air might get mixed in. It's this nice smooth stream of clean air. And that means that provided that I'm really clean and I don't introduce any bacteria and I keep the room really clean, um, I can do this sort of work without accidentally growing molds or bacteria. If I were to make one of these Petri dishes uh, with this agar medium in it, um, you know, and just pour it in my kitchen or anywhere outside my garage, this room, uh, leave it for an hour, put a lid on it, come back a few days later, there would probably be multiple species of fungi and mold and bacteria in it, possibly dozens and dozens of species. But if I do the same thing in front of my flow hood, provided that I'm careful and I do it all right, when I come back and check on them, you know, seal them up, tape them, check on them a week, two, three weeks later, absolutely nothing will be growing in there. Uh, indoor air can have thousands and thousands of particles in every cubic inch. So you really need some, I don't know, kind of fancy equipment to do some of these steps. And that's what kept mushroom cultivation kind of out of the hands of the average person for a long time. In recent years, both um, technological advancements, uh, advancements in information via the internet, and also um, companies like my own have allowed mushroom cultivation to kind of spread more to the average person because I can do all of this and what I have at the end is grain spawn. And grain spawn can be used for a bunch of different things. You can use it to spread into straw in open air. Um, the straw should be pasteurized, but pasteurization doesn't involve pressure cookers or anything fancy. Um, it can either involve 160 degree water for one hour. You dip your substrate in there, take it out, let it cool, mix some grain spawn into it outside in your basement, in your garage, doesn't matter. Um, stuff it into bags or containers or buckets and a week or two later, mushrooms grow out of it. You can also do what's called cold water um, sub, cold water pasteurization where we, we actually did this Saturday for a group of Girl Scouts at our warehouse. Uh, we had a troop of Girl Scouts there. We took a bale of straw, broke it apart, stuffed it in a barrel with um, water and some agricultural lime. Agricultural lime is a uh, um, very alkaline, it's very basic, and so it changes the pH of the water in a way that kills all of the mold spores and bacteria. Then we took it out, let it drain for half an hour, the Girl Scouts showed up, and half of them were holding their noses and complaining about the smell of the fermented straw, but it wasn't really that bad. It smells like an old barn. But we spread it all out in our warehouse. Um, we had everyone wash their hands, and then I took some grain spawn, and the grain spawn Grain's super nutritious, so any mold spore, any bacteria that gets in here will start consuming it and competing with the mycelium. But straw is not nutritious, and straw is largely made up of this really complex carbohydrate called lignin. Lignin is what gives trees their strength, and almost nothing in nature can consume it except for lignoculus fungi, fungi that like to eat lignin, um, which is one of the many reasons that mushrooms that grow in logs kind of just do their own thing. They don't have a lot of competition. No one else can get in there and bother them. Uh, but oyster mushrooms and a number of others can consume that lignin. So we took the 
I'm Spawn. I broke all the grains apart. We, me and the Girl Scouts mixed it all together. We stuffed it into these bags and tied a knot in the top just like this. Uh, and now they'll take it home. They'll keep it humid for a week and then um, kind of start giving it fresh air every day. And mushrooms will grow out of holes that we cut in the sides of the bag. So it's a very um, low tech, easy way to grow mushrooms. Um, it can be, you can still grow a lot of mushrooms easily that way too, if that's something that you want to do. Uh, it can really be expanded. One of these bags of grain, you could probably inoculate between one and two bales of straw. Bale of straw is about 60 pounds dry. Uh, so after it's wet, it's about 100, 120 pounds. So uh, at the most, let's say you did two bales of straw with one of these bags, it's like 240 pounds of wet substrate, um, straw and water when you're all done and stuff it into your bags and containers. And it could probably produce up to 100, even a little bit more pounds of mushrooms from just 240 pounds of straw. Um, some mushrooms can turn all of the weight of the dry substrate into fresh mushrooms. So from a 60 pound bale of straw, mix it with water, stuff it in buckets, you might harvest 60 pounds of mushrooms, which is pretty incredible. Uh, sometimes when they're done growing from the straw, there's like nothing left. It's like 10% of its original mass because the mushrooms have made so much mushrooms out of it because that's what they do, they consume things. And so here we have mushrooms that are being laid out in a tray and then they put compost on top of it. And that's how you grow Agaricus bisporus, which is the portobello. It's also the button mushroom and the cremini and the baby bella. They're all the same mushroom. They're called Agaricus bisporus. And they grow um, outdoors historically in manure. And so they are totally happy growing in non-sterile environments. In fact, they need it. They need to grow in sort of dirty environments where they uh, have relationships with different types of soil bacteria. So we call these sometimes compost mushrooms because you can spread out the spawn and then just pour compost or manure on the top of it. It's aged manure, so it's not like, you know, full of dangerous parasites. They um, let it age for about a year. It's a leaching process, but then spread it out on top and the mushrooms grow right through it and consume it. So it's a mushroom that once you've got that grain spawn, you can grow in a very dirty environment. Same thing with the ones that grow on straw, which is all of the oyster mushrooms. Sometimes lion's mane and chestnut people do okay with on straw. There's a handful of others that will grow on straw as well. Uh, and oyster mushrooms have a about a dozen species worldwide, but dozens of sub-varieties that are all slightly different from one another. So it's a pretty big group of mushrooms. Um, you can also take that grain spawn and uh, put some of it into a bag of sawdust, which is similar to like our fruity medium. We add some more nutrients to it, but it's basically a bag of sawdust. Uh, and then take that and plug it into wooden logs. Um, you can also grow the mycelium on little dowel rods and hammer them into holes inside of wooden logs. Then you cover those plugs with uh, edible wax like cheese wax or beeswax, put them in a shady area, and one, two years later, um, you'll start to get mushrooms that grow from them. And sometimes they'll produce mushrooms depending on the mushroom, the type of wood and the size of the log, up to a decade. So it's one afternoon of work and you can harvest mushrooms every fall or maybe every spring and fall for five, seven, eight years or more. Uh, it's a really, really um, low tech, low involvement way to grow mushrooms, uh, very hands off, but you just get them seasonally and you have to have the right type of wood um, harvested at the right season and use pretty fresh. When wood is, when a tree is freshly cut down, there's antifungals in the wood. And you wanna wait a few weeks for those to sort of dissipate. But if you wait more than a couple months, other types of fungi will start to grow in the wood. And so, and you wanna harvest them in the fall or early spring. So you really only have a narrow window and you have to use a certain type of tree and you, you know, there's a few steps to it. But if you have those things, it's a really great way to grow mushrooms. Um, I have a number of friends who grow mushrooms on wooden logs. You know, when they, you know, trim a tree, that's what they do. I did it earlier this uh, fall I, with a bed of wood chips from a tree that fell um, at our house a while back, made a um, similar to the um, bed they're showing or the straw that they're showing here. We spread out a bunch of wood chips and cardboard. Uh, and straw and mixed in spawn for a mushroom called a wine cap mushroom uh, and grew those outdoors. And uh, okay, so here's some more of the primary decomposers, mushrooms that we grow often. This is our greenhouse here and me holding some shiitakes. 
King oyster is a mushroom that you can grow on beds of wood chips or on straw, pasteurized straw. They're one of my favorite mushrooms to eat. They're also the cutest mushroom that we grow. Um, they're really neat. And they're also not only my favorite, but the third most commonly cultivated mushroom worldwide. Um, number one is the agaricus bisporus, the portobello and cremini. Number two is shiitake. And number three is this guy. And then oyster mushrooms as a group, all of the oyster mushrooms, um, make up about as much as shiitake when you lump them together. They're extremely popular in Asia, the king oyster. This is a mushroom that's not earthy like a portobello. It's not fishy like some oyster mushrooms. It's a real mild but very savory flavor, especially if you saute it until it browns some. It's got like notes of like the finer flavors of like a pork chop or ham or bacon. It has these sort of very savory qualities that you wouldn't expect from a mushroom. Um, for some mushrooms and certain dishes, I really like to use this stuff called liquid amino acids to season them with. It's a source of natural glutamate, and glutamate is one of the only things we can actually taste. We have receptors for it on our tongue, and it tastes um, umami, which is another word for like deep, rich, savory, um, like meats and aged cheeses and things like that have a lot of umami. Uh, and so do some mushrooms, especially if you augment them with more uh, by using the liquid amino acids on them. Soy sauce is a good source for it as well, but soy sauce has this sort of um, funky fermented quality that the liquid amino acids do not have. Uh, golden oysters, they're, one of, they're, they're another really easy one to grow. You can grow them on straw, you can grow them on wooden logs, you can grow them on beds of wood chips. They're extremely vibrant and beautiful, almost unnatural in color. This little sad cluster of them I have up here today is not as bright because it was grown during the um, rain we had last week. And mushrooms, a lot of them actually derive their color from sunlight. In fact, a lot of mushrooms make uh, pigments in their flesh through an interaction with an enzyme in their flesh and sunlight, very similar to ourselves. And in fact, most darker colored brown and black mushrooms, the primary pigment in them is melanin, the same thing that gives us color, yet another example of how they are more animalistic than they are plant-like. Uh, and so um, growing them in total darkness will often make them albino. Uh, and there's a, a story I could tell you about enoki mushrooms when it comes to that, maybe we'll have time for it. Um, pink oysters are really fun to grow. We mostly grow them because our customers like them, but they're almost kind of a novelty because they grow in like two to three days, which means we have a very small window, one workday window in which to harvest them, after which they're too mature and we have to put them in the compost. And they taste really good for one day. The second day they taste good, but not quite as much. The third day it's kind of like, eh, eh. and by the fourth day you don't want to eat them. So they have an extremely short shelf life, but they're vibrant and beautiful uh, and a very fun one to grow, especially with kids, but even for yourself. They're super neat and extremely fast growing. They're a tropical species of oyster mushroom. This is our Michigan oyster on the left. They're big and hardy and firm. We cloned that mushroom in the wild in 2015 or cloned it from a wild specimen. And I've been growing it for the last um, you know, eight years. And I've probably grown 15 or more tons of that exact same mushroom. They're all genetically identical uh, in the past eight years. Lion's mane on the right is another one that grows on straw, okay, but it does a little bit better on either wooden logs or a sterilized sawdust medium like we grow in our bags here. Lion's mane are really neat. They have been used in Asia for thousands of years for uh, as a supplement to help like um, mental health and focus and memory and mood and all of these supposed things that they help with. And then in the last two or three decades, there have been a whole bunch of different studies, both animal and really convincing human studies, that have shown that they do help with these different things, mood, memory, cognition, um, to prevent and help to treat different neurological disorders, specifically uh, multiple sclerosis, because they cause they help restore and um, sort of support this uh, sheath that covers our nerves. Um, and when that sheath breaks down, that's what multiple sclerosis is, basically. It's a destruction of this myelin that protects your nerves, and then your nerves kind of start cross-firing, and the electrical signals don't travel through them, just like if you took the you know, plastic insulation off an electrical cord, it would send electric to wherever it could. Your nerves do the same thing. So myelin um, can be, the breakdown of it can be slowed or possibly reversed by using this mushroom here, lion's mane. Then it also causes new neurons to grow in your brain, which can help prevent age-related cognitive decline and also prevent 
um, cognitive disorders. There was a really cool human study, and there haven't been a lot of human studies on these, um, its potential for treating neurological disorders. There was a cool one last year with uh, Alzheimer's, and they gave it to two groups of people that had fairly early onset Alzheimer's, like in their 50s and 60s. Um, they gave them all the exact same treatments, but one group got lion's mane. It was a concentrated form of these two chemicals that are supposed to be good for you in it. Um, but they got it twice a day in like a capsule form. And at the end of a very long study period, like nine months or a year, um, they the group that got the lion's mane had uh, scored better on tests of cognition and memory and all these different things, which is... Um, really great, but what was really cool about it is they also did, gave questionnaires and interviews to their family and friends, and the group that got the lion's mane scored better according to other people in their life as well. And then most importantly, they did blood tests, and um, Alzheimer's, just like any other disease, leaves biomarkers in your blood. They can tell you know, how much of the disease you have or how quickly it's progressing by these chemicals that are left behind in your blood that are basically byproducts of your brain starting to break down. And the people who got lion's made had significantly lower um, measures of those compounds, which is a really uh, quantitative way to um, sort of measure a really qualitative kind of difficult to, to measure thing. Uh, Oh, there's our Michigan oyster, the gills on the bottom side. I just thought that was a neat picture. And so the primary decomposers, the ones we just talked about, um, a lot of them grow really well on wooden logs. Some of them grow well on straw. Um, but then there are some others that you just have to grow in this sort of sterile um, the medium that makes them kind of challenging for people at home. But then there's a whole group of secondary decomposers. These are the mushrooms that we sometimes call compost mushrooms. They would come in after a primary decomposer has broken down a tree and you know it's half dirt now and you can pick it up and break it apart with your hands. That's when these guys start to grow on them because these guys actually need different types of um, soil bacteria in order to survive and thrive. And so a couple examples of them, wine caps are these burgundy ones here. But there's also um, bluets and shaggy manes, um, portobello and a bunch of its cousins in the same agaricus species or genus, I should say. All of those can be grown from beds of compost. Some are more challenging than others. Trad Cotter's book is a fantastic resource for learning about those types of mushrooms. You can grow outdoors like that. Uh, and the process is, is basically as simple as, um, like for wine caps, I'll show you another picture here. Um, Oh yeah, and I've got a link to it here as well. Um, but for wine caps, we'll take uh, cardboard, soak it in water just for a few minutes till it's saturated, spread it out on the ground in the footprint of the area where you make want to make your mushroom bed. And this works not just for wine caps, a bunch of others as well, but wine caps are sort of the prime example. Uh, spread out your cardboard, then put down a layer of straw, which you should also moisten in water, um, and then spread out some spawn. Now, when you're working outside, you don't want to use green spawn because it's really nutritious and it attracts bugs and birds and insects. So you would use sawdust spawn, which is basically what's in this bag, my final fruiting substrate. It's mostly just sawdust with the mycelium growing on it. It's a lot less attractive to the wildlife. But you sprinkle that around through the straw, and then you put down a layer of moistened wood chips the wood chips you want to soak overnight in a barrel or a trough because they need to absorb some water and it takes them a while. And then you repeat the process. Moisten cardboard, moisten straw, uh, thin dusting of spawn, and then moisten wood chips. And you do that till the bed's about eight or 10 inches deep. Um, check a week or two later and you should see white fuzzy mycelium growing through it. And then if you do it in the spring, sometimes as early as mid-June, you can be harvesting mushrooms and they'll grow basically every time it rains all summer long and into the fall. My friend um, has harvested wine caps as late as like late October a couple of times in his yard. Uh, so it's a really simple process and it works for a bunch of different mushrooms. It's just depending on the mushroom, you might use slightly different ingredients. Um, another mushroom I like to grow outdoors called a wood bluet. They grow from piles of deciduous tree leaves. So it's same idea, but you substitute leaves for the wood chips. And so, or add some leaves and put in less wood chips because they'll kind of grow off wood as well. Um, some mushrooms need something that's been more well composted. So you can actually take um, like kitchen compost and garden compost 
break it down till it's you know mostly soil like and grow things like agaricus mushrooms uh, the button mushrooms um, and its cousins from those types of mediums so there's a whole bunch of different compost loving mushrooms that will grow happily in a shady area in your backyard um, under a tree is often a really good place to put one of these beds uh let's see and so agaricus bisporus um, this mushroom, it's kind of interesting, I'll mention this real quick. N not only is it the portobello, the baby bella, the cremini, it has all these different names, but historically it was always just the portobello and they were always brown. And then in like 1922, there was a farmer in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was then and is now like the U.S. capital of mushroom cultivation. Almost every mushroom you've ever eaten in your life uh, is grown in Pennsylvania. There's some big farms out west as well, but if you live in the eastern half of the U.S., almost all the portobellos, creminis, baby bellas, button mushrooms come from Pennsylvania. And he found some white ones growing on a pile of manure, and he'd never seen them before, but he knew they were the same mushroom because they were growing around the brown ones. So he got them into the hands of someone that knew how to clone them and propagate them. And for almost 100 years, every single white button mushroom on the face of the planet was the exact same organism. They're all genetically identical. They were clones of one another. Just like I've been growing my Michigan oyster mushroom for eight years, this mushroom has been growing since 1922 and will continue to grow you know, far beyond our lifetimes. Now, in more recent decades, a number of different cultures or genetic um, versions of this mutation have entered into the, the sort of mushroom growing world. But for a long time, the better part of 100 years, they were literally all the exact same organism, which is pretty neat and sort of hard to comprehend. Um, mushrooms, uh, mycelium under the right conditions can be grown exponentially and indefinitely in both space and time. It can grow forever, producing whatever quantity of mushrooms you can give it food to produce. Um, they're almost like eternal. It's pretty wild. Uh, and so agaricus, you can grow those in your yard. You can also get them at Meyer, so not as many people are interested in growing them, but they've got some cool relatives that you can grow as well. These two grow in Michigan. These grow in my front yard. Um, they're both edible. They're both cultivatable. This one over here, the almond portobello, doesn't grow here. It's more tropical, subtropical, but a lot of people really love it as a edible mushroom, and it has unique medicinal properties too. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but just like lion's mane has these compounds that are really good for neurological health, there's tons of mushrooms who that um, there, it has been suggested through a long history of use that they're really good for inflammation or um, uh, your immune system, all these different things. And, you know, I'm not one to assume that, you know, just because a an ancient medicine is a thing that it, it must be real. In fact, you know, a lot of ancient medicines we've found are not effective or even dangerous. But when it comes to mushrooms, a lot of these historical uses that they have have proven to be true. And they have proven to be this vast source of all sorts of novel compounds that interact with our bodies because they're really similar to us. And so uh, antibiotics are the best and example for people to sort of comprehend. Um, penicillin, which most of us have probably had at some point in our life, is derived from a mold called penicillin. And all modern antibiotics, all of the antibiotics any of us have ever consumed in our lifetime were either directly discovered as a byproduct of a, a fungal mycelium, or they're um, synthetically derived but inspired by compounds produced by fungi. All of our antibiotics come from mushrooms. And there's a ton of other things that they can do for immunity, for inflammation, for neuro neurological health. Um, it's just a vastly expanding field of science, which is super cool. Uh, uh, it's almost, oh, I'll talk about this real quick. It's almost time for me to stop so I can have a few minutes for Q&A. But um, here's an example of what I was talking about earlier using straw pasteurization. You can either, again, soak it in hot water. When we first started as a farm or started sort of expanding to want to grow mushrooms commercially, uh, my friend Aaron and I knew that we could grow a lot of oyster mushrooms on straw, a lot of different types of them. So we went to like, 
Goodwill and got a big stock pot and a bunch of big pillowcases and some straw and went in his basement. We were chopping up straw because if you chop it into smaller pieces, it works better. We had like cheers and garden trimmers and his wife thought we were like losing our minds. So we're downstairs boiling water and dunking these um, baskets of straw into it. Uh, but we put the straw in there. We let it sit for 160 to 100 or in water that's between 160 and 180 degrees for one hour. Take it out, let it kind of drip dry. Squeeze out the excess water, spread it out on a table in his basement, mix our spawn into it, and then stuff it into five gallon buckets that we had drilled holes in. Uh, a lot of mushroom farms will grow in like plastic tubing, but it's single use plastic, and I try to reduce that when we can. Uh, and so using the buckets was really cool. We could sterilize them and reuse them over and over again. Um, but it's a really easy way to grow mushrooms, and they grow fast. Sometimes with oyster mushrooms, like the pink oyster or our Michigan oyster, and some of the other faster varieties. From the day that you make it and stuff the mixture of um, spawn and straw into the bucket, you can have mushrooms in as little as nine days starting to poke out of those holes and be harvesting them three to five days after that. So it's like a two week turnaround. Um, that's probably why they're a fun project to do with kids like the Girl Scout troop that I uh, got to work with the other day. Uh, I could come back to some of these slides. Um, if we don't have a lot of questions, but do you guys have any questions? Um, anyone? Anything at all? All right. Maybe I'll talk for a few more minutes. We'll go to like 7.40, 7.45, and then probably wrap things up and get out of here a few minutes early. Uh, and so, and please stop me if you do think of something that you'd like to ask during these last few minutes here. And so there's a bunch of mushrooms that um, really like to grow at cool temperatures which is good because there's not a lot of insects that are gonna damage them at that time. You know, mushrooms are soft and delicate, and if you ever spend any time in the woods looking at wild ones, you've seen they're often very um, eaten up by insects. Some mushrooms are more attractive than others to insects. Uh, and so growing mushrooms that fruit at cool temperatures is a great idea, especially if you're growing them outdoors because you'll get them in the spring and the fall. In the summer, it's, you know, often the bugs get to them before you do. So um, like these guys, these different types of oyster mushrooms, they grow below 70 degrees. You mostly find them fruiting in the spring and the fall. Some of the others, like the pink ones, um, they like to grow in really warm, I must have went past it, really warm temperatures, also the golden ones. So if I were to make a, uh, you know, straw bed or some wooden logs of those, they would probably fruit during the height of summer. And I would have a very short window, one in which to pick them because they go from, you know, tiny to fully mature in just a few days, but also on a really short window in which to beat the insects to them. So I kind of discourage growing some of these outdoors, but because you can grow them on straw, they're fantastic to grow in garages, basements, outbuildings. Growing mushrooms indoors isn't um, difficult when it's at a small sort of hobby scale. All you have to do is provide them with a humid environment and a little bit of fresh air. And so like when people grow our mushroom growing kits, uh, but people, they're the, these large ones at least, are the same size that we use at our farm. And all you have to do is take it home. Um, depending on the mushroom, most often you cut a big X in the side of the bag and then mist it with water two or three times a day. If you have like a humid older basement, you may not even have to do that. We've been able to grow mushrooms at our house and we don't have like obvious water problems in the basement, but for most of the summer when our furnace isn't running and stuff, I can put one of those kits down there, cut a hole in it and mushrooms will just grow out of it. Sometimes they'll get a little bit of yellowing around the edges because it's not quite humid enough for them, but that's as simple as it can be. Um, in the picture here on the right, we made these buckets. We didn't put them into the greenhouse. We thought we'd get to it a few days later. We came back. Uh, and we had made them in this old dusty barn with no added humidity. Uh, and when we came back, they were fruiting beautifully on their own. And part of that is because in the spring and the fall, here in Michigan, it's basically perfect mushroom growing weather for like two months, maybe even 10 weeks, um, depending on the year, because it's, it's super humid and it's cool. Uh, so <clears throat> growing mushrooms indoors, um, if you were wanting to grow them in the winter or in the summertime when they're not gonna do well outside, can be really simple and rewarding as well. A couple things to know about it. Let's see if I can find this slide. Mm, went the wrong way. So when you're growing mushrooms indoors, um, 
you know, you don't have to worry about insects, but you have to provide them with some humidity. And you also have to provide them with some fresh air. And mushrooms produce a lot of spores, um, millions and millions, sometimes trillions. And so you don't want to grow them like in your bedroom or um, in your, you know, kitchen where you're going to be around them all the time. Or if you do, you want to pick them when they're on the younger side before they've released on their, all their spores. Um, Basically, and we've got some more details about this on our website, like for when people buy our grow kits, they can tell when to pick their mushroom. But most mushrooms, as they're growing, the margin of the cap is curled down or even curled under. And as the spores reach maturity, the cap unfurls and opens up to allow air currents to move in and carry away the spores. And so the shape of the margin of the cap is the single most consistent indicator of the maturity level of the mushroom. So picking them on the younger stage um, makes for better mushrooms. They taste better, they have a better texture, um, they haven't released their spores, and so they still have all of their mass and, and um, density to them. Uh, but it also protects you from potential lung damage, um, not damage, but allergic reactions. Some people are more sensitive than others, but some people, especially people who have asthma, can have an asthmatic type response to uh, mushroom exposure. And I had an older lady at the Holland Farmers Market, a customer of mine years ago when I used to work that market myself, who bought a grow kit. She grew it in her bedroom. Um, a couple weeks later, she came back and told me that um, she was having trouble breathing, she went to the doctor, and her and the doctor figured out that it must be this mushroom kit. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, where were you growing it at? And she was like, right next to my bed. And, and so I started telling people, you can grow them inside, but don't grow them in your bedroom or a room that you're spending like, you know, most of your time in. Um, but basements, garages, um, for the next six weeks or so, covered porches, unheated garages still work well. Uh, and, you know, honestly, a lot of times in Michigan in recent years, our winters are so mild that if you have an attached garage or a garage under your house, you can probably grow mushrooms in it all winter long. Uh, a lot of them will grow at like right above freezing temperatures. They just do it very, very slowly. Uh, and so growing them indoors can be really fun um, and really easy. Some people, they have a lot of trouble. They have to run a humidifier or mist it all the time, but that's uncommon. For most people, 80% of them or so that buy our grow kits have decent or really good success growing the mushrooms from them. Uh, a couple other things, like um, we have a customer who has a, a, a spare bathroom and he just keeps his mushroom kit in the bathtub and then goes in there and runs a little water a few times a day. You don't wanna run water directly on them, but just keeping them in a place where there's moisture can be enough to keep them humid enough to grow. Um, at least, you know, if it's in the dead of winter, it gets a little bit trickier because people's houses tend to be dry. But then again, we have some customers who run a humidifier in the winter in their basement. They put their mushroom kits next to the humidifier and they're able to grow mushrooms easily indoors in the winter. We have another customer who puts it in her kitchen sink um, and covers it with like a plastic drape and she lives by herself, she's older. She just doesn't use that half of the sink when she's growing a mushroom kit and she says she hardly has to do anything else to it. So it can be really simple uh, and it can be really rewarding and fun to grow them indoors. Um, growing them outdoors, you know, it, it's seasonal. Uh, and if you're just doing it as a hobby, it's also fun and rewarding. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You don't have as high of a chance of success when you're growing them outdoors, um, with certain mushrooms at least. But it's also, uh, you know, I do this one afternoon and I get to harvest mushrooms all summer, or I get to harvest mushrooms for a decade from this wooden log. So um, even though you're not as likely to have success every single time, the amount of you put into it is much lower for the same um, amount of reward versus growing them indoors in a controlled environment. Uh, so, and then at the end of the slideshow here, um, if you guys want to get this from me later, I've got some, sometimes I do these classes for like garden clubs and stuff. So I've got some neat info in here about um, just some bullet points that you could look up more on your own about some of the things that mycelium can help do for soils, which I think is pretty neat as well. Uh, but it's about 745 here. So before I close up, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I have one. So you were talking about using the straw and how the mushrooms consume that. And there's very yeah. little left sometimes on like certain varieties. But have you ever tried adding more of the straw? Yeah. So it you can. A lot of times what happens is 
Mushrooms have sort of like a vegetative state where they're growing through the medium and then the flowering state where they're producing mushrooms. And sometimes it's hard to get the mycelium to go back to that other state. Um, with like um, beds, that, mushrooms that grow in beds of wood chips like wine caps, where their natural medium is a bed of wood chips, a lot of times you can just keep adding more wood chips to it year after year. What happens though is bugs and worms end up getting in there and the they love mycelium so much that they kind of you know grow in there and then you can't they, they can eat the mycelium before the mushrooms can fruit. And so you end up developing a basically an insect problem if you keep it in one spot. With straw though, it's different because most of the mushrooms that grow on straw would grow on a wooden log in the wild. And so they're not, they kind of just either have that, I'm eating this log or I'm fruiting mushroom stage and it's hard for them to go back and forth. Not to say that there aren't mushrooms that will fruit off the same tree many, many times. Um, but when you're growing them from like um, straw or one of these bags, there's just not a lot of protection for them. And so you often, if you try to add more medium, you end up growing bacteria or molds. A lot of times the mycelium on the surface of the substrate has kind of died back and other stuff can start to consume it. Whereas if it was growing in a wooden log, it just kind of, you know, goes into hibernation for a while and it's undisturbed and it's still clean. So it can be done, um, but it's not always super successful. And um, are pine trees a problem? That's a really good question. So kind of, yes. Um, a lot of uh, softwoods, pines, cedars, firs, they produce antifungal compounds. And so um, most often mushrooms won't grow on those logs. There's only certain species that will grow on them. And they're usually not the ones that we want to eat. Most edible mushrooms that grow on logs grow exclusively on hardwoods and not softwoods. And so uh, a lot of mushrooms won't grow on them. And then also growing mushrooms like on the soil directly underneath them is probably not advisable either because of the acidity levels. Now, if you have a bed of of you know wood chips and it's got layers of cardboard underneath it that's probably fine but I'm trying to use the soil in any way immediately around a pine tree would probably not work out that well any other questions yeah how would you go about inoculating the soil around trees to help the trees grow and not really worry about the mushroom growth uh so mycorrhizal fungi that's good for trees is not something i'm super fluent in uh, but there is a lot of research being done, and I'm sure you can find more online. I know that the process of adding it to the soil can be really simple, though. Uh, basically, there's two different approaches. One is to take a sawdust-based medium and incorporate it into the soil. Uh, and the other, which is probably applicable in more situations, is because a lot of mycorrhizal fungi, they wouldn't grow from sawdust in the wild. They would grow from the soil. And that's part of why I don't know a ton about them. There's not a lot of overlap between edible mushrooms and mycorrhizal fungi. There's some, but uh, most of the mycorrhizal ones aren't edible. But anyway, what you can do for a lot of those is create a very, um, a sugar water solution with a very small amount of sugar. Over 4% sugar starts to have preservative effects and things and will deter fungal growth. But we take 4% um, sugar, uh, a water solution of 4% sugar by weight, and then add some mycelium to it and mix it around for a few days. And mycelium actually starts to grow and suspended in this um, nutrified solution. And then you can just pour it around the base of host trees that we know have a relationship with that specific fungi. So it can be done, but sourcing those mycorrhizal fungi is sometimes the challenge. Um, there's a lot of products that are sold and I don't know enough to recommend any of them, but I would recommend doing some research before you buy one. I think a lot of them are probably not that great. I think a lot of them are probably, you know, I've seen like miracle Grow has mycorrhizal potting soil. You know, who knows what types of fungi they put in there and what types of plants they might actually be beneficial for because it's often complex. Uh, and so um, just because a fungus is good for one plant doesn't mean it helps another. So it's kind of a complex subject. And I feel like we may not be there in some ways when it comes to using mycorrhizal fungi in our gardens and soil, but it's, it's quickly developing. And I believe there are probably are some good products out there. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Do you have any concerns about your fungus and things inside colonizing onto your wood? 
it shouldn't, if we lived in like a subtropical place where it was super humid all the time, yes, I would definitely be concerned about it. Um, but if that were to happen, it would indicate a serious moisture problem with your home. Um, that shouldn't normally happen. Now it has, and it does, and I've seen pictures of oyster mushrooms growing from you know, wet carpet and wet baseboards, but it, it, it normally is not a concern. Well, great. I hope that this was helpful for you guys. Thank you for being here tonight.